We are here tonight at the Martha's Vineyard Film Center um, enjoying a grant that we received from the Coolidge Corner and Sloan Foundation in support of Science on Screen. And what that means is that they are trying to enhance the image of science, scientists, engineers on the silver screen as a way of promoting science in the general public. And so we will be doing a four film series starting tonight with Bombshell, the Hedy Lamar story. And we are really appreciative. This is the second year uh, that we've received this grant, a 75,000, excuse me, a $7,500 grant, uh, allowing all of you, most of you, to come to this free as members of the Martha's Vineyard Film Society. So we thank the Coolidge Corner Theater and also the Sloan Foundation. Okay, yeah, round of applause, those two organizations. And actually, we'll, we'll show a little trailer, a two-minute trailer before our main film, a little more information about science on screen. Um, our special guest, as I mentioned earlier, is a very, very talented woman entrepreneur, scientist, and inventor. And we felt with the context and subject matter of tonight's film, the Hedy Lamar story, who to many, maybe you knew that she was an inventor. She invented a, a number of things, including an improved stoplight, though I don't think we have any stoplights on the island, so um, an improved stoplight, but she's probably best known for uh, coming up with a uh, spectrum technology, I think it's called spread spectrum technology, which was supposedly going to be used to um, guide torpedoes during World War II. Uh, because radio frequencies were easily jammed. So she worked on this with a friend and submitted uh, a petition, a, a pet patent to the uh, Naval Department. Unfortunately, it never got approved by the Naval Department. It was never used in World War II. But later on, this same technology became the basis for things like Wi-Fi. You've heard of that. Bluetooth, GPS. How many people use GPS? on their phones, in their cars. Most of us do. Her technology was the basis uh, for all of those things. Her invention, I should say, was the basis of that. So it's going to be a very interesting story. Uh, but also as a glamour actress of the 1930s and 50s, I think she sort of had a sort of a grudgingly sort of opinion about Hollywood and the whole thing about glamour because she was once quoted saying that any woman, any girl could be glamorous all you have to do is stand still and look stupid. <laughs> that was her quote. So you can tell, here was a very bright woman, sort of, unfortunately, in an industry that didn't really uh, put much uh, emphasis or, or value on intelligence. But uh, that's our story for tonight. But our special guest, as I said, Catherine Jin, is here. She is a COO and founder of a company called Kinos. Uh, and she'll tell you more about it. Um, she has been won a number of honors already. Um, she was voted in Forbes 30 under 30, meaning 30 women entrepreneurs under the age of 30. Actually, she's only 23. It's, it's just amazing. Uh, a Columbia University graduate in computer science and bio biology. Um, and she's going to talk about what's the life of an inventor like, uh, especially as a woman, and uh, I think it's going to be very in, in sort of stimulating and enticing and, uh, in, you know, leading into our film about Hedy Lamar. So, Catherine, it's time for your grand entrance. Here she is, Catherine Jin. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, you're welcome. So, you're going to use this mic, right? Okay. And Catherine has a slideshow. Yeah. Some visuals. Is this on? Hello? Yeah, it's on. Just have to Okay. Hi, everyone. As Richard said, I'm Catherine. Um, came from Manhattan today, took the flight over. That was super awesome. It was a great first introduction to Martha's Vineyard. Um, so as he said, I'm the COO and co-founder of Kinos. It's a company I started in college. And the goal is to improve the decontamination of infectious diseases. So hopefully I can talk a lot about my journey as a woman, kind of t contextualize what it means to be a female entrepreneur, and ideally this will all connect to the movie that we'll watch later. 
So this is me back in 2002. Let me know if you can't hear me again. Um, I Surprising fun fact, I grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana. People don't usually look at me and think that. Um, but not so surprising fact, I was a really good kid. Um, I got good grades. I played the piano in my free time. My mom used to complain that I leave like stacks of books around the house. So basically, I was like a super nerd. And so when I was a kid, the first movie I remember watching with my parents was a movie called A Beautiful Mind, which is about that mathematician, John Nash, who's at Princeton. He battles mental illness with the support of his wife and eventually wins a Nobel Prize in e econ. And basically, you know, he has this amazing theory that fundamentally changes not only math, but also all of its applications. And I watched that as a really young kid. And when I watched that, my first thought was, this is the coolest movie I've ever seen. I want to be a famous mathematician. As I told you, I was a really good kid. So I like dreamed of in the future working at an elite university, um, like writing math formulas like on the board, like basically kind of everything I had gotten from that movie. And that had been my childhood dream. So really think like seven, eight years old. By the time I got to middle school and high school, though, that dream had started to dissipate. When I got to middle school, I was really excited to join this team called Math Counts because this was my first step in the path of becoming a math genius. And when I first joined the team, I remember boys would tease me and say, the only reason I was on that team was because they needed one girl on the team so that we could go to competitions. And then in seventh grade, I took this test to get my radio license, which I also thought was my next step on being you know, th the greatest science mind ever. And when I failed the test by one question, a teacher was trying to comfort me, and he told me, you went a lot farther than I thought you could as a girl. You did a really good job. So obviously, you know, these comments really accumulated over time. So by the time I got to college, and high school, I didn't really think I was capable of competing against boys and men in math and sciences. So in high school, mostly I was doing Model UN, Mock Trial, which are all debate teams. I loved history and the humanities. So I thought maybe this was the niche that I could carve out for myself. I wouldn't have to compete with people who would be better with me. I, you know, as a female, could succeed in this space. And so when I got to college, I tried out a bunch of different majors at Columbia. Initially, I was political science. I hated it. Then I did human rights. I also hated that. And then I did Russian literature. My parents really hated that. So it was this progress where I couldn't really find anything that I could connect with. But on the side this entire time, I'd been taking biology and computer, sciences because, be, computer science classes because that's like what I had always cared about. But I really wasn't that confident that I could compete against some of the smartest kids I knew at the school. And so the reason I'm telling you all of this is to contextualize my journey a little bit so that you saw who I was before I started working on this company. I was not very confident in what I could do. I didn't really want to dream the dreams that I had you know, thought of as a kid. I was really felt consigned to the fact that, yeah, I'll major in something that maybe I don't really like that much, but at least I'll be good at it. So what changed my life was the Columbia Ebola Design Challenge. So colleges do this thing now called hackathons, where they take a bunch of students, they put them in a room, they tell them a problem, and then you have to sit there for 24 hours and figure out a solution. And so when they had an Ebola Design Challenge, this was specifically designed for any student. So you didn't need to be a CS major, you didn't need to be in biology, you could really be from any area. You come to this hackathon, they'll tell you the problems healthcare workers are facing, and then you'll develop a solution. So one of my good friends, Jason King, the one in the middle there, it was actually his 21st birthday, so he didn't want to go, but I made him, thank goodness. And we went and we learned that one of the biggest problems during the Ebola crisis was ineffective decontamination. So you probably have seen this yellow suit maybe on the news, but this is called a PPE suit, personal protective equipment. If you're a healthcare worker treating a patient with Ebola or really any infectious disease, you're all suited up so you won't get infected. When you're done treating the patient, before you take the suit off, you get sprayed down with bleach. And the idea is you get sprayed down with bleach, that'll kill all the Ebola, you take it off, and you live your happy life. But that wasn't what was happening in West Africa during the Ebola crisis. Lots of healthcare workers were dying, and in countries where there are already very fragile healthcare systems, this really impacted the epidemic response and made the epidemic way worse than it should have been. So one of the biggest problems we learned was that first, bleach is transparent. No one knows exactly what they've decontaminated. Second, bleach rolls off waterproof surfaces. So you want to cover a surface 100% of the time, right? 
But you guys know what rain looks like hitting an umbrella. That's exactly what bleach looks like hitting a PPE suit, hitting a tent, hitting a hospital beds. Every surface in a hospital or an epidemic setting is designed to be waterproof. So therefore, when you're throwing bleach on it, nothing's happening. And then lastly, a lot of people don't know that to actually work, disinfectants need to be applied on the surface for a certain amount of time. So for example, here's a Lysol wipe. You guys have probably used Lysol wipes or some similar brand. And if you look on the back, it says to disinfect, allow to remain wet for at least 10 minutes. I know I have literally never waited even close to 10 minutes when I've cleaned something down with a Lysol wipe. And I don't think a lot of us have. And at home, this is not usually that big of a deal. You're not killing like Ebola at home, so it's okay. But in hospitals and in epidemic settings, no one's waiting this amount of time either. So if you're in a hospital getting a minor surgery, if your housekeepers aren't waiting three to four minutes with their hospital grade bleach, Nothing is getting killed, and you could be susceptible to a seed of infection, a Mercer infection, a staph infection, which really could cause unnecessary loss of life. So our solution is Highlight. It's a powdered additive that you add into disinfectants at point of use. It colorizes the solution so you can see exactly where you applied it. It also forms this film that sticks. And then the really cool part is that the color fades when decontamination is done. So you don't need to time your surfaces, you don't need to wait there, but when it's blue, you know that you can't come into contact with the surface, and when it's clear, when the surface looks normal again, you know that it's been cleaned. Thank you. <laughs> so a lot of people ask us, okay, cool, you had an idea from a hackathon, but how did that turn into a company? So when we were juniors, Columbia really pushed us out um, to get a lot of cool news coverage, so a lot of bucket list items here. We were on NPR, The New Yorker, Wall Street Journal. That was really awesome. And someone from the fire department of New York reached out to us. The chief medical officer sent us an email and was like, hey, I read this really cool article about you guys in The New Yorker. I want you guys to come test your product with our simulations. So in New York and in actually many cities around the world, the first people on site when there's an infectious disease are the hazmat teams from the fire department. So they were the ones that first responded to that Ebola patient in New York, and they were trying to beef up their protocols with our product. So obviously, we were really excited. We were juniors in college. I didn't think anyone would ever want to see this. I thought this was just going to be a cool thing in the lab. And so they come up to Columbia. They drive us down all the way to Staten Island in a fire truck, which is also super cool. And we get to Staten Island, and this is like what we see. This is an actual bad iPhone video I took of the time. But if anything, I hope it captures the chaos. There are sirens everywhere because they're running a mock Ebola patient. Firefighters who are like huge guys are wearing these PPE suits. They're all suited up. They have our product. They have bleach. They have tents. They have fake patients. It was really crazy. It was also so cold because it was the winter. And my co-founder didn't wear socks. So he was like dying. So we got there. It was a really exciting night. We give them the highlight to put in the bleach. And all of us are watching. All the firefighters are watching. Nurses come out of the hospital to come watch. And we're all really excited. And they start to pump the sprayer. Then they start to spray. And as they're spraying, nothing's coming out. And we're all like, oh my, this is so embarrassing. Like we came here, everyone made a big deal that we were here. Like Kevin's been complaining about not having any socks. Like everyone knows that we're here and that this isn't working. And the chief medical officer came to us and said, I don't know what happened, but I'm going to give you another chance. I'm going to contact you again next time we run a training. So we went back to Columbia. We fixed it. We found out it was a problem with the cold. We had never tested in sub-zero temperatures. Like, why would we have? So once we fixed that product, um, we were ready to go when they emailed us. But time went by, and we didn't get an email, and we kind of fell back into the routine of school. So as you know, life goes, the night before the biggest organic chemistry test of the semester, we get an email from the fire department that's like, come tonight to Mount Sinai, we want to test again. Now, you know, as a very mature college student, I had not started studying until that very moment. So if I didn't stay and study in the library, I literally would fail, have failed that exam. So Kevin, Jason, and I all unfortunately were in that class together. And Jason, hero, decides he's going to intentionally not study, he's going to bomb the exam, and he's just going to go see, see what happens. So he goes to Mount Sinai. Kevin and I are in the library. I'm not really studying because I'm so nervous about what's happening at Mount Sinai with Jason. We get a test from Jason that says, it worked. And we're like, oh, thank God it worked. Great, now we can start studying. Awesome, awesome. And then we get another text from Jason that says, they want to buy 200 units. And then Kevin and I are like, what? They want to buy from us? 
how do we make it? Are we a company? How do we sell it? Do we need to go through regulations? And Jason comes back to, to Columbia, and in the stairwell of the library, we decide to incorporate as a company. And that's the very first time we realized we had actually generated something that brought value to people. So that was a really cool story. And ever since then, obviously, we all flunked a lot of tests because of Kinos. So it all equalized in the end. Jason got also got an A minus in the class, so he was fine. <laughs> so this is us um, when uh, the FDNI FDNY was using it. You can see the blue. This was super exciting for us. So after that, um, we thought we had some traction, so we applied to competitions, to grants, and we really got a big break in February of the next year, in 2015, when USAID gave us over half a million dollars of non-diluted funding to do R&D, to go to West Africa, to test with real field workers. And we also were doing the competition circuit around that time. We won a bunch of random school competitions, a lot of uh, free non-diluted funding, and met a lot of really cool people around the nation. And this was a really great time for us because we had all this funding. Really, you know, we weren't giving up anything. We weren't giving up any part of our company. And we had all these cool opportunities to go abroad. So for the first time in the fall of our senior year, we took two weeks off of school. And we went to Liberia at the end of the Ebola crisis. So this is us actually on the ground in Liberia. Um, we were working with some NGOs there to field test our product. And now this is a really amazing experience for two reasons. First. We actually working with end users, learning their stories, understanding the difficulties that they experience day in and day out, not only inform your product, but also really motivated us three as a team. We were all seniors at that time. We all had difficult majors. We all were thinking about grad school or getting jobs. So we had kind of lost some focus on Kenos. And being here again and then coming back to school really made school seem kind of silly and made us realize that working on something like this is vastly more important. And getting this out as soon as possible is really what our life goal was at that time. And the second really cool thing was really understanding how these people lived. So after the Ebola crisis and at the end of the Ebola crisis, these, a lot of these healthcare workers were stigmatized. There was a lot of superstition surrounding Ebola so that if anyone had ever been kind of in proximity, if you had had it and healed, if you had been a healthcare worker, you were shunned by your family. A lot of people were kicked out of their family homes. And a lot of these people were regular people that had just stepped up at the time of the crisis. And when we were there and they were using the product and they were loving it and telling us just how much they liked it, it made us feel like we we're really actually making impact like, in their lives. So that was a really cool experience. And we also went to Guinea at the end of our senior year again um, to test. So we field tested on the ground there twice. And I really want to emphasize um, field testing. So a lot of us, you know, when we think of field testing, it sounds like super glamorous, but it wasn't. It was really hard and it really sucked. This is me getting decontaminated in bleach. Um, this is like in like 115 degree weather. It's like so humid. So like when I take this off, I'm literally just like soaked through like three layers of PPE. But you have to go through so many rounds and it's so hot, you can't see where you're spraying. And also no one, obviously no one is waiting the contact time. And this really shows you how easily, you know, someone can get infected, especially in a high infection case like Ebola. So really important to get yourself out there, see what's happening, see what's going on. I look really nice in these videos, obviously. <laughs> so that was kind of an overview of how we got started. Ever since we graduated, we've been working on a new product for wipes for hospital-acquired infections. Basically, a lot of people go into hospitals for minor surgery, come out with a life-threatening staph infection, um, and we want to stop that from happening. It's the same principle, except for bleach wipes that they use in hospitals. The idea is that you add the color, you see exactly where you've applied it, and then the color fades based on the contact time of the disinfectant. Um, last year, we raised a round, an outside round of a million dollars, so we're funded and fully ready to go to get implemented, and we're about to begin hospital trials, start getting some studies out, and hopefully we can show that we actually reduce infection rates. So this has been a really cool and exciting project for us. Really, you know, speaking per very personally, this came out of nowhere. It's kind of crazy to think that before I started this, I didn't even know what my major was going to be. I didn't even know if I was smart enough to be a science major. And then after this, I have, you know, been a co-founder on a product, on a technology that I'm so proud of and you really think has so much potential. And, you know, building a company kind of from ground up obviously was difficult. But I think by being a female, it made it <laughs> only harder. So now I want to kind of switch gears and talk a little bit more about my journey, how I grew up along the way, and like, what were the three most important things I've learned so far being a female inventor? 
So the first one is to build women up. I think all of us actively need to take part in that, not just women building up other women, but really everyone building up women. Um, so, you know, running a company with two male co-founders really showed me how differently I was treated. For example, if I was pitching at a competition and my two male co-founders weren't there, judges and staff would like comment on what I looked like or what I was wearing or my shoes, and obviously showing me that they weren't taking anything that I was saying seriously. We would go to pitch meetings and I would be answering questions or presenting, and literally the entire time, sometimes investors wouldn't even look at me. They would ask a question, I would answer it because I knew the answer, right? And then they still were just looking at Kevin and Jason. And so therefore, it's really not surprising at all that I had entered college and high school thinking that I was incapable of doing all of these things. Even when I had shown them that I could, they still, I was still invisible in those rooms. And this isn't a problem just faced by women, it's also faced by a lot of people of color. And I think my advice that I had gotten a lot when I was growing up was, don't take it too seriously, don't take it personally, like don't make a fuss, don't be dramatic, don't be sensitive. Like, put your head down, work really hard, your work will speak for itself. That's what I always thought. And then when I go into these meetings, and I'm pitching, and I'm showing them that the work that I've done, and they're still not looking at me, it shows me that my silence doesn't really win me anything. Obviously, the way they perceive my gender, the way they see me, can't transcend any of the work that I've done. And therefore, that's a fundamental issue that's kind of beyond what I can do. And that's why kind of my philosophy now is to have a zero tolerance policy on those kinds of comments. Sometimes people say it's a joke, I don't care. Other times people mean it maliciously. But yeah, regardless, I think it's really important to stand up for yourself and also not only educating other people, but making sure that you yourself feel valued. If you're used to wiping those comments off, not thinking they bother you when they actually do, you're doing yourself a great disservice. And so my second piece of advice was always to strive to be better. So the idea here means to have high expectations for both yourself and other people. So very recently, I was at an event in New York. And it was an event for technical co-founders. There's this big tech company. They're throwing this really nice event, drinks, hors d'oeuvres. And the idea was they put together a bunch of technical co-founders in a room. And we all talk about the company, the, the issues that are facing our individual startups. And hopefully, we can come up with some cool solutions and share them with each other. So first thing I noticed was I got into the room, it was 20 guys and like three women. The second thing was I was talking to another male co-founder and I was telling him about the Kinos technology and he was doing the, wow, that's so cool, that's so awesome. So I felt really great. I was like, this is a really good conversation. He really gets it. And then the next thing he says to me is, who developed it? And then I said, me, I'm at this technical co-founder event. Why wouldn't you think I had developed it? And he was like, you? No. And then obviously I think he could tell that I was upset. I probably looked the same level of annoyed that I look right now. And he immediately backed off and he said, no, 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 don't take it that way. Don't take it that way, I didn't mean it that way. But what other way could you have meant that? Like he didn't know me, he didn't know how smart I was, he didn't know what I knew, he just saw me and didn't think I was capable of doing it. And I'd like to think, I'm not like a dumb looking person, like really what could have been, we all know is my gender. And I think this happens to me a lot. A lot of the time when I call out people for talking down to me or mistreating me, their first response is, I didn't mean it that way, or don't take it like that. And I think instead of always trying to like hasten to cover up your mistakes, make excuses, these are all really great opportunities to actually learn something and you know, be better. So what could that guy have done? He could have said, I'm sorry, I understand that the way I spoke to you was about your gender, and I'll think about why I did that and get better in the future. That's it, I don't need you to like kiss my feet or like buy me stuff. Like all you need to do is just be a good person to show that you've listened to me, right? And so obviously I don't think that guy or any of the other men that have done this to me in my life are horrible sexist pigs who hate their mom. I just think they're like misinformed and they've internalized a lot of stereotypes in society about what women can or can't do. And then when they put that on me, I'm not gonna let that happen. So I think it's very important to Therefore, you know, have high expectations for yourself. Make sure that you're constantly questioning yourself, seeing if you're making assumptions about women or people of color that don't really make sense if you think about it a little bit more. And then the last thing I want to talk about, oh, <laughs> thank you. The last thing that I want to talk about is if they can't see it, they can't be it. So if you ask me right now, like name the most major inventors of your lifetime. I'd say like Bill Gates, Elon Musk, 
And then if you ask me, like, of all time, like Nikola Tesla, like Thomas Edison, but that's a pretty homogenous population of inventors. Honestly, standing here right now, I probably can't even name that many women or people of color inventors. And that's not because there aren't any women or people of color inventors, it's just that we don't remember their names. And every time we put down a woman or a person of color and tell them what they can or can't do, we're consigning those people to the same fate. And representation isn't just important in real life, it's important in media and the arts as well. So, as I've said multiple times growing up, I was a huge nerd. My favorite show was Star Trek. I loved it. I watched every season. I watched like all the offshoots. Like, I'm a huge Star Trek fan. And so when CBS this year, last year, did a reboot of uh, Star Trek, I was really excited. And when I watched the first episode, I was shocked because the lead character was a black woman. And she was serving under a Chinese captain who also was a woman. And that was an amazing experience for me watching the first episode. Like, I was kind of tearing up on and off, aka I was crying, during the whole episode because it was really amazing to watch two women who looked like me who were having conversations on screen that weren't about like what they were wearing or like what dude they were talking to, but about like amazing things like what are we gonna do about like this alien that's attacking us? That was really cool. And they're all capable and courageous and strong. And when I watched that episode, I thought to myself, what could I have been like if I had grown up seeing these representations in media? What could I have believed that I could do? What could I have actually achieved? What confidence would I have had if I had grown up seeing women on screen, people on screen that look like me? So this is a picture of my team. <laughs> I don't think I put that up yet. But um, basically what I want to talk about here is that all the accomplishments and the success I've had so far in my time working with Kenos have really only come because of the women that have like forged this path before me. So, for example, you know, some professors I had at Columbia that were amazing, my biology professor, my fundamentals of computer systems professor, both amazing women who are smart and capable and really showed me that, like, I can dominate in male-dominated industries. And also, you know, my own childhood heroes who are indirect, like Hillary Clinton or Sandra Day O'Connor, who I, from a young age, have always looked up to and aspired to be like. And so, I think it's really exciting that we're all going to watch Bobshell, the Hedy Lamar story, and hopefully we can all give credit and recognition to a woman who's contributed so much to this world. Thank you. <laughs> you are a rock star.